Okay, guys, this is a historical moment in the Weightlifting Life podcast. <laughs> Ursula and I are three feet apart instead of three states apart. Honestly, I like it better when she's in Texas. Oh, shut up. <laughs> You're still in my view. Yeah. So <laughs> Ursula came to visit. She slept in until about 3 p.m. today. So, so not true. It was like <laughs> You're right. It was two. Noon. <laughs> Ursula Van Winkle over here decided to show up for the podcast. Uh, this is episode 46. We are just continuing the slow crawl <laughs> towards 50 episodes. One of these days, before one of us dies, we're going to get it in there. I think getting, the goal is like 100. We're getting passed we're up by not, every podcast we're, we're, that started six weeks ago. <laughs> They're already on episode 50. <laughs> we're eating their dust. Yeah. But that's okay. Ours is better anyway. Yeah. It's not about how many. It's about it's how the good. quality, yes. About how fascinating and entertaining the two it's of us quantity, are. not quantity. It's quality. Yeah. Um, the problem now is that Ursula is going to be able to see when I'm on my phone screwing around, not <laughs> listening to her, but I'll be able to see when she's not listening to me. Even though I don't I even always have my, I didn't even is. bring my phone. I'm so focused right now. Oh, uh, well, I just have so many responsibilities in oh, life. Oh, whatever. Uh, we do have listener questions as always, but actually we I have like a how couple. You, you make that known because we're not going to do them. Which no, we will. Gonna, I'm we'll, more, we'll get to them eventually. Yeah. But my point was that we have a couple topics that Ursula brought up, which are good topics. We agreed, and uh, we're going to cover those first. Well, we started just talking about um, some habits that people bring over because one of the questions talks about transitioning from crossfit to weightlifting and people seem to think that you're moving from one sport to another as if they're really closely related and just because you've been doing snatch and clean and jerk in crossfit doesn't mean that you know how to snatch and clean and jerk necessarily you don't say <laughs> so I would really approach that if you're transitioning from, that was with Cody Marks around it, from <laughs> CrossFit to weightlifting, that you're really a new weightlifter. Yes. Because you're going to have to go back and work on your technique. And, it, well, and probably learn how to lift for the first time. Unless you were in a gym where you had weightlifting classes with a, a coach that was qualified and you, you were taught proper technique to begin with. But if you were just crossfitting and weightlifting was part of the crossfit crossfit workout, probably haven't had the technical input and direction to really consider or yourself even just the a, opportunity a, a, to practice. Right. If yeah. You're, if you're, you're just doing, doing them it. within a metabolic conditioning workout, it's very hard to practice the movements. You kind of need that time in isolation to to develop that technical proficiency. And the other concept that would drive me nuts when I've worked with. Um, crossfitters that have transitioned to weightlifting is this idea that you can make up shit like if you redo a workout yeah. like I, I missed a lift so i'm gonna do it again so i'll have lifters that have you know four doubles five doubles and they miss one rep of a double so then they're gonna add another set and i was like so you could be here all fucking day <laughs> because if you keep missing one rep of the double and instead, you try to add another set. It's the fourth yeah. attempt mindset. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you, 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 you know, it says four doubles. You do four doubles. If you miss some, then you've just failed to complete some doubles. But you you don't extend that to 18 doubles. Yeah. Which really becomes 18 singles anyways. <laughs> so anyways, I, I, I'm just annoyed. Um, and then one thing that came up is I had an athlete that would try to redo workouts. The whole workout. The whole fucking workout. Yeah. Like one part would go shitty and then like miss some percentage that they were supposed to be hitting, probably for some technical reasons more than anything else. And so the, I, I, they're just going to come back in in the evening and redo the whole workout. Seems unreasonable. Yeah. Annoying. So that's just not a thing. You, you go on to the next workout and you um, get some sort of remedy in place for well, why you had yeah. an unsuccessful workout. Just repeating. What if you repeat the workout and it's shit again? Like, what are you going to do then? Repeat it again? Like, I don't even know where this is going. Why would people think that's a reasonable response 
Well, I think you you it's have rhetorical. to have. I'm not sure. You no, can I, no, it. I think it's an important question to answer, though, is because I think the, the the only reason anyone could believe that repeating a weightlifting workout was a productive thing to do is if they don't understand the physiological impact that workout has, right? So if they think, oh well. If I practice the piano for an hour and it doesn't go well, I'll come back a few hours later and I'll practice again. That works. Yeah, sure. 99% of the yeah, time because sure. playing the piano for an hour isn't particularly taxing yeah, on you physically and taxing. yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's a learning thing. It's it's making your brain work, but like your fingers aren't going to be annihilated the next mm-hmm. day from playing the piano for 2 hours. Snatching and clean and jerking, especially if you're squatting and pulling and doing things like that as a way a uh, bigger effect on you. You can't just go throwing those things around. If that worked, I'd be training six times a day, seven days a week, and I'd be snatching 200 kilos by now. Yeah, I would. I have bad workouts all the time. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't probably go that route, but... Um, <laughs> well... I mean, right now, I can't even sit up, so I can't even think of doing a snatch, but... Yeah, no, no I don't There's no sitting in so. snatches. There's sitting in the hole, locked yeah, out. squatting. I will. It feels like a sit. You don't sit into a chair when you snatch, I hope. I could. (laughs) As long as it's not a rolly chair. Yeah. All right. So, anything else we need to cover about repeating workouts? No, I think I I got my... Actually, you know what? There is one more. There's one more thing I would add to that is I think there are certainly times when you need to pull the plug partway through a workout and come back later or another day. Sure. Like, if you get started on a workout and you get partway into your first exercise and it is very obvious that it is not going to happen for whatever reason your dog died you're sick mm-hmm. you're you're yeah but really you're talking unfocused. about real reasons that people well, have yes. i mean you were to, I, i'm i'm referring you know what i'm referring right. to people who are you just, miss one lift yeah, out they, of 65 they, and they just and it's the they didn't the world. snatch what they thought they were supposed to snatch and didn't go as well so they're just going to come back and do it again and they're right. just going to repeat that until they get the result they want which is probably going to be never because you keep doing the same damn thing. And I had a conversation about this with Danny Camargo years ago, and he made a really good point Name that I dropper. liked. I know. We're basically <laughs> best friends. Uh, he, uh, No, I, I really like Danny, and I think he, he made a great point that when you allow lifters to constantly repeat sets because they missed you are basically training that mindset yeah, sure. that you get to it's there's nothing on the line if yeah. you miss right it, they don't take well you're they possibly. don't have the same respect for that and then you go into a competition where you got limited, three limitless yeah, option you limitless, got three attempts yeah. and so if you have that mindset of like well if i fuck this one up i just I'm get just, to yeah, do it again i'm gonna use all three all of a sudden that's a rude awakening when you're like get to your third attempt and still haven't made a snatch and you go so no can I come back it. later and do this one? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna tell you. I'll be you, back later. I'm not even shitting you. There was uh, in Texas that happened, where an athlete competed in a session, and they let that athlete come back and compete again in a later session to try to qualify for a national event. Guess how that worked out? I'm sure it went great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, so he's not on a world team yet. Nope. Yeah, I, I I don't. How is that even legal? I'm not sure it is. I, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. That's why I'm all you know. Like it seems ill advised in every possible way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It it seems like we should. I mean, that's why I was trying to tighten up the guidelines for meets and making sure that meet directors understand what they're supposed to go like, and that you can't just do whatever you want and then put the USAW you know label on it. Yeah. But um, you know that's a whole other issue. I'll, I will deal with in time. Um, the other thing that I think has uh, been on my mind, and, and uh, I think, I mean, right now there seems to be a lot of transition as people are getting ready to um, try to start making world teams that are going to impact their ability to make the Olympics. Um, but just in general, I, I get a lot of questions from coaches that are developing coaches about their athletes changing coaches and stuff like that because sometimes athletes are you know they're they're just on the search always they think it's the coach has more to do with their success than they than they probably do at least initially um i mean obviously coaching you know the quality of coaching you're getting is important but i've seen a lot of new coaches do really good jobs with athletes so um but 
you know, every once in a while you'll find the athlete that is not satisfied and they're really quick to blame the coach for yeah. their lack of success as opposed to things that matter like time invested, consistency of training, uh, effort, you know, the other not things that matter. Not staying out all night, every yeah, night, yeah, the, not eating for, four pizzas a week, yeah, drinking. recovery, you know, all the things that would also impact your progress. I mean, you can kind of look around and if all of the athletes you're training with aren't making progress, then maybe there's a problem. Right. But if you're the only one and, you know, you have other things that could be causing it, it I think people tend to want to blame someone else instead of, you know, looking introspectively and saying, what oh, the fuck course. can I do better? Yeah. But in any case, um, there seems to be this, you know, process of, for people to leave their coaches or change coaches. And very often they're not, I think following a respect a way they're not doing it in a way that is considerate and respectful of the effort that the coaches put into them up to that point. And so I just wanted to kind of lay out some potential steps you might want to look at before you decide you're going to switch coaches. First, I would advise you to actually talk to your coach and explain to them your misgivings and your concerns. Um, a reasonable coach who is confident in their abilities will want to have that discussion. Yeah. Um, what you don't do is go behind their back and start negotiating with another coach and another club or whatever and getting all these things set up for yourself so that you can just jump ship. It's a real slap in the face to somebody who's put time and effort into you. Um, so once you've had this discussion with your coach and you've explained your grievances and they've you know responded, you've at least given given them a chance to answer even if you've already think you've made the decision this could change your mind you never know like what's going on with them as well they may not know that you want to compete or qualify for an american open right. or whatever your goals are if you weren't clear with that at the beginning um then i well, think it's and, and smart the, in, to make in, a joint decision like you know the the ath the coach will say should say if the athlete wants to leave you know great it was it was nice working with you you know, let's, you know, not burn the bridge, yeah. stay friends, stay if you if you need me for anything. I mean, you never know when you're going to be at a meet, like we have this question, and not have a coach, and there's a coach that's familiar with you and could potentially help you. Like, there's no reason for it to get nasty when someone changes a coach. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, coming back to your step two, the communication part, so much of the time that is the proximate cause of the athlete wanting to leave in the first place, right? Is that there was poor communication. The athlete felt that maybe something was obvious to the coach when it was not at all. A lot of athletes, I think just like a lot of coaches, believe that the other person in the relationship can read their mind <laughs> and that, that things are much more apparent than they often are. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I vividly remember a conversation with one athlete and, uh, when they first came to me, uh, you know, for the, maybe like the first six months, uh, you know, I, I obviously I did a good job with, with them, but I wasn't overly invested and in like really knuckling down because the distinct impression that I got was that this athlete was not particularly serious about being competitive and going as far yeah. as they could. A recreational and, lifter that you're just trying right, to keep which, them on the platform for a long time so they can do it as yeah, a lifetime sport. Which is totally yeah. fine with me as long as we've established that. Mm -hmm. And when I finally talked to this athlete about it, the basically what the athlete told me is the exact opposite. No, I want to be the best I possibly can. I want to make world teams. And I said flat out, I'm like, that is not at all the impression I got from you based on the way you talk about things, kind of the what you're doing in training or what you're doing outside of training. And so had had we not had that conversation at that point, you know, had we let that go for another year, that athlete very rightly would probably have wanted to leave me as a coach because I wasn't doing what that athlete needed and, and wanted. And so what you want to do is avoid those situations. And as an athlete, you have to be assertive to some degree and make sure that, you know, 
what you want to achieve is clear. What you well, need I've is found, clear. I found athletes that they come in with, oh, I just want to, you know, I just want to learn how to lift, and yeah. I just want to do, you know, maybe I'll do a local meet, or I don't even want to do a local meet. I just want to do it as my recreational fitness routine. And you're great. You know, your whole focus is just, you know, to get them moderately stronger over time because you want longevity for them and you want to make sure they don't get hurt so they yeah. can keep enjoying it. And uh, and of course, you're trying to do that with everybody, but when you're pushing for an, a higher level athlete or for competition results, sometimes you're walking a line in which you're, you know, you could incur, you know, some sort of tendonitis or other injury that can set you back. And so you're always trying to avoid that. But what I'm saying is you're not you're not pushing as hard. Right, of course not. To, to hit certain numbers at a certain time. But that, you know, kind of nonchalance that you might perceive in your lifter at some point could change. And if they don't tell you when it changes, because I've had plenty of athletes that say, I don't really want to compete. And then we're all going to a local meet and you find out they, w- they wanted to go too. Yeah. Well, you know, you gotta, you gotta right. say something. Right, you can't expect a coach to know that when it's that been said explicitly your, before. Yeah. You yeah. don't. Well, then I do a questionnaire when they first come in, and some of the things that you know they put on the questionnaire don't always match up to where they are a year later. Right. And so, like, then well, they realize sometimes you get far enough along, you're like, well, shit, I'm really close to qualifying yeah. for the American Open. Now I want to try to do that. Well, and so. and of course, uh, you know, any athlete is entitled to change their goals mm-hmm. over time, but again, those goals have to be continually communicated with the coach. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you end up in that situation where the athlete resents the coach. The coach is unhappy because his or her expectations are not being met, and feels like maybe the athlete isn't living up to the standards. You know that the coach feels are are uh, reasonable. So just don't let it go so far that you feel like the only solution is switching coaches. When it's quite possible that it would be quite an easy fix if you and the coach were just on the same page because you talked. I don't know. Be an adult. Figure it out. And well, then, I think if you do talk adult, to a coach, respectful, considerate, upfront, honest—all those things are just basic values we should all have. But we, and most people, you know, hopefully have some, <laughs> at least some part of that. And if they, but if you maintain that in that relationship, I think the relationship you have with your coach has, is is an important one. If you're, if you, um, and and if you if you pay them, then. It become it should be important for both of you, and yeah. even if you don't pay them, like you should be on the same page as to what the goals are, and making sure everybody's working in the same direction. Um, the other thing I've noticed, and it's it's just really odd to me that um, athletes are are switching coaches on on fairly weak pretexts. You yeah. get a lot of coaches coming in that are um, newer, and they might have some measure of success, and you know they become. And I've seen this before where there's an it coach. And everybody wants to train with that coach, um, whether the coach has some, you know, basis for that, for being the it coach. I mean, a lot of this, some of these it coaches really have, have done nothing in terms of producing successful athletes. Good self promoters, right? They're self promoters. They're maybe marketing or or whatever is putting their name out there more frequently, and and people are are leaving for their coaches who are invested in them. Uh, on on really weak bases and that's kind of a, a bummer to see um when someone else has done a, a a lot of work to develop an athlete and then for no perceivable um logical reason someone decides to jump ship just because there's this new wave of new something going flashy on flashy stuff yeah. out there and i i think that's something also to consider as an athlete is How much time have you invested in the current coach, the current system, the current gym? And is it an adequate amount of time to actually make a legitimate evaluation on whether or not it's working for you? If you've been there for six months, it's enough time to get an impression, but it's not, that's not necessarily going to give you enough time to make a fair assessment on, you know, the programming. And Mm -hmm. any new athlete that comes to me, especially an established weightlifter, one of the first things I tell them is, listen, I'm not a magician. Like it's going to take some time for us to to figure out what you respond to best. Absolutely. Like it's not an overnight thing where yeah. I, I on day one I have the perfect program for you. I yeah. wish yeah. that'd be awesome. It would save me a hell of a lot of hassle and stress. 
Um, but you do have to give it some time. Now, if you've been there for four years and you're not making any progress, obviously there's a problem. Yeah. Although it's not well, necessarily it obvious at, that it's yeah. the coach's right. fault. It, because I've seen a lot of these athletes who are bouncing around coaches, they are quick to blame the coach and everything else, which seems to be a, just a constitutional problem with certain people. Is they, they cannot accept responsibility for anything. And when you, when you actually get down into it, they're not even doing what the coach is telling them to do yeah. in the first you're place. The damn so how every fucking week, you how can't is it really the coach's the failure? Yeah. yeah. So it, it's make sure that you are actually looking at what's going on before you make that decision, because there are a lot of lifters in USA Weightlifting who have a reputation as being coach hoppers and gym hoppers. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, the fewer coaches want to work with you the because they good know coaches that are history. Want to work with you because they know that they might invest this extra time and effort into you and then you'll be gone. Yeah. Well, and, and, so and if you, wary. if you do it the right way, like Ursula is saying, and you, you have a grown up conversation with your coach, you keep things civil and, and respectful that gets out there too. And then the next coach is able to talk to your former coach yeah. and everybody's fine. You might get some really important feedback, you know, in terms yeah. of like what kind of programs do work for them or what wasn't working for them. And you have the ability to make those assessments more quickly instead of trying to figure it out again. Because every time you start with a new coach, you're rebuilding not only a relationship, but they're trying, they have to then evaluate what kind of programs uh, and your timing for your peaking and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's something that happens with repeated assessment um, of, of results and, and the athlete uh, and the program. And so that requires time. You know, if you get it perfectly right the first time, you just probably that's called lucky. luck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's called luck. And I mean, I'm definitely don't think that in a community this small, coaches don't talk to each other. That's all we do. It's yeah. <laughs> and if if you have been the kind of athlete who has been really difficult to work with and and tends to be someone who blames everything but their own effort and behavior and, and attitude, everybody will know in short yeah, order. Yeah. You're not going to hide well, that. Maybe the newer coaches won't know. And they'll be, you know, the thing with the they'll newer find coaches, out. yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, they'll find out, but they'll be quick to jump on something because they think it's going to do something yeah. great for them. And that's, um, you know, that's kind of shameless. And, well, yeah. And, and, and to be fair too, we should probably look at this more from an athlete perspective too, because we've been kind of harping on athletes and making coaches seem like they are not flawed. There are plenty of times when a coach is not doing a good job or is not adequately invested for, you know, in consideration of your goals and your commitment. And in those cases, you do not have an obligation to stay with a coach no. who is not doing a good job. Not at all. So don't get us wrong when we're saying, like, it's not all about pleasing the coach. Not at all what we're, what we're implying here. It's about making sure you, you actually evaluate properly and fairly. And then you take, you know, the, the right course of action to make the transition properly. So if you've been with a coach for a while, if you've communicated, you've had that opportunity, you've given the coach the opportunity to change, um, you know, whatever shortcomings are, are apparent and it's not getting better or it's getting worse because they resent you for it or, you know, questioning yeah, their that, authority that's, yeah, or whatever, that's not, that's not a, then you need to move on. That's not an acceptable response from right. a coach. Because really in those cases, that athlete might be helping alert you to something yeah. in terms of you're not spending enough time with us and or on me or with me. And, you know, the, the coach has an, an opportunity to yeah. reflect on whether maybe they're not. I mean, maybe we, coaches have lives, too. <laughs> well, some of us. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it takes. A, but yeah, a, a, a good coach. And again, like you said, a good coach who's confident in their abilities will take that feedback very reasonably they're not going to get super defensive and jump down your throat yeah. they're going to listen to what you have to say that very likely don't expect them to just accept everything you say at face value they're probably going to come back and say well, well here's where maybe that's fault. what you yeah. see it but like this is what i'm seeing from my perspective and and so be open to hearing that too because it's definitely got to be a two-way street there Right. Yep, yep, is that yep. horse dead and buried? I think we've buried him again. We probably dug him up <laughs> to begin with. This poor horse. 
Uh, all right, what's next? A question from Vanna. Vanna White. Maybe uh, not Vanna White. Probably not, because that has two ends. Um, I'm Warren you Chew, smarty it? pants. I know. Um, well, what did I say? 311 or 611? Yeah. <laughs> Ursula's like, well, call 64912. Isn't that what it is? <laughs> it's for the emergency line. <laughs> no, Ursula, it's 911. Uh, hi, Greg and Ursula. Thank you for this great podcast. You're welcome, Vanna. Not only are you both hilarious to listen to, but I have found that I can often relate to the questions being asked as I am fairly new to weightlifting. I've been weightlifting on and off for two years because my schedule didn't permit consistency. This last 10 months has been very consistent, and I just started going to local meets. I've qualified for the American Open, but I have found... Congratulations. Yes, good job. But I have found myself in a position where I don't have a coach to coach me for it. Is it a bad idea to go to the American Open without a coach? I'm already signed up, so I guess that's that. (laughs) But for future meets... (laughs) Yeah, I guess we don't have to answer this. But for future meets where I don't have a coach, do you have any recommendations as to what I should do to ensure I have someone? Thank you in advance for your insights. Do you know a coach? Because um, it doesn't have to necessarily be your coach that coaches you if um what you want is somebody who is familiar with competition coaching uh and there are plenty of coaches i would say yes go but i would try to line someone up before you get there yeah um we have a good network really um if i don't go to a meet and greg's going to be there i can you know say hey greg how many athletes do you have are they do you have any in this session and the, the what, good thing is if he's got exactly one athlete in the same session then he's going to be there anyways yeah and we can just throw my athlete on the platform with his athlete and he can take care of him and i do the same um and you know we can ask any of our friends basically um so it's good to have a coach and it's good to have a coach with other coach friends because that's the network now, if you don't have a coach, what I would do is I would ask around. You may be able to go on the website for USAW and find a club nearby that has a coach and call up that coach and find out whether he's going to be at a competition. You could also look at the list of teams that are entered in the meet and maybe call up um, or, or go again to the USAW website and pull up the club information and see if one of them is available um, but most of us, if we're not bogged down with all our own athletes, if we have an open session, we're usually pretty good at trying to help and encourage new lifters uh, get through the whole process until they find a coach. And, um, I, you know, my very first meet that I went to, oh, my very first nationals in 1988, I was going and my coach at the time, Mike Huska, was like, when you get there, you're going to ask for John Coffey. So I got there and I asked for John Coffey. Um, and that was just, you know, somebody he knew. And of course, I ended up lifting for coffees for the next, what, 13 years. But I, uh, it was his, it was that contact initially that, um, because Mike moved, not because I jumped coaches. <laughs> Mike moved to Nebraska after that. But, um, you know, Ben Green ended up warming me up. Couldn't ask for someone better. He's a coach to a bunch of male Olympians. And so, I mean, they're not, you know, most of the coaches, regardless of their level, are not um, shy about trying to help someone new to the sport. Um, and so you sh- I, I would reach out and try to find either from a club that's going or um, if, you, if, if you know anybody that does compete, reach out to them. If you have some friends that are competitors, you know, see if they'll if get their coach's contact information and see if their coach will help you. But, uh, I mean, you can show up. I've seen a lot of people just show up, and they end up getting somebody of pretty good caliber helping them. That's not rare. Um, so Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would definitely do your best, like Ursula said, to line up someone beforehand, but don't panic if you haven't. Um, I have helped people... You know, I've been in the back room with one of my athletes and there's been some, you know, nervous person first time who's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'll just say, just jump on the platform and take care of it. It's yeah. not a big deal. The uh, the only well, there there are some dickhead coaches out there because they're human beings and human beings can be dickheads. But by and large, most weightlifting coaches are coaching weightlifting because they like coaching weightlifting, which means they're going to be pretty open to helping someone. And they do like helping new people. And 
especially they like helping new people because it's so easy to look like a good coach in front of a new person. <laughs> They're going to walk away thinking you're some kind of freaking genius, right? Because you knew how to warm them up every three On attempts. Time, yeah. yeah. Um, but I've, you know, I've had people wander in and you're just like, you can see it on their face. Yeah. They, they really don't know what they're doing and you just, or they're hey, come over on there, and, they're over there at the cards trying to count for themselves, right. loading their own bar yeah. and all that. Or, or you'll have them like, Hey, can you please like go tell me how many attempts out? And you're like, do you want to just warm up with us? Like, or you, they, so the, what I was getting at is most people are very willing to do that. The only situation in which a coach is going to be reluctant to help you is if you are they have a good athlete in that session or and you athletes. and well yeah they have already have three athletes or something that's a lot to handle or they have a good athlete and you are direct competition with that athlete then i would you say you probably don't even want to ask that coach it's probably. well you, but you they if it's a new person they're not going to know no, yeah but that that would just be prepared for that and i, I had that happen well, to me at this last person, nationals and you're already uh, oh you're talking about competing with the athlete not necessarily competing for medals Right, yeah, right as yeah, in yeah. someone's like right next, next to you know yeah. lifting the same weights yeah. it's kind of as a, a coach i interest feel interest like that bit, is yeah. unfair to your own athlete yeah but i would also say hey i can't do it but so, i know so, this yeah. coach over here on the platform next to us so let me introduce you whatever so most people are going to be very accommodating and very nice but don't like if you do get turned down for a reason like that, like a coach has three athletes at the same time. Or they have somebody who's expected to win. Or, or yeah, exactly. They really have to they focus. Want, yeah. Don't take it personally. Like they're not trying to be rude or they don't care. It's just that it's, you got to understand that situation is, is unique. But yes, you, you definitely, what I was going to say is you, you do not want to go to your first national level meet and have to warm yourself up. You're gonna ha you're gonna yeah, have plenty somebody. of nerves, plenty of stress. Yeah. Like you want to be able to go focus and have some fun. And you can find somebody who will help. Um, again, try to find them before you leave. But if you can't, <laughs> you know, just start asking around when you get there. You'll start meeting people as soon as you get there if you just say something. You just walk into the hotel lobby and you can't help but run into weightlifting people. They're everywhere. Swarming. They won't leave you alone. <laughs> All right, Vanna, you're set. Your life has been fixed. Problem <laughs> solved. I wonder if this was the American Open that just passed or these new questions. Uh, this was a pretty new one, which is why I okay, grabbed so it. Maybe it's so maybe it's a go-to. I'm 99% sure. Uh, okay, Jonathan, tips on preventing a forward motion when catching. <laughs> I find that more so with the snatch, I slightly hop forward. Is this a matter of patience and timing of the triple extension? Uh, oh. Someone was asking earlier if the questions we get uh if anyone ever sends video and stuff and i said it's very rare so this is one of those ones that it's it's a really open-ended question because mm -hmm. that's gonna be a million things but at the same time what i told this person who asked me is that it's kind of good sometimes because then we can say okay well this is where you would start you know to try to diagnose the problem and some steps to figure it out so i'm gonna start at the floor start <laughs> okay well there you go start at the floor walk us through it um Snatch us through it. Snatch us through it. Well, are, are you moving from the ground to the knee in a way that puts you in a hang position with the pressure midfoot or towards the ankle when you get to above the knee? If you're on the front of your foot as you're passing your knee or if the bar goes around, if the bar goes around, it's going to pop out off your hip and then that bar is going to be forward. Even if you try to mitigate it, it could be forward. If your bar path looks like a backwards, a backwards three. three yeah. um, <laughs> oh, wait, it'd be a regular three if you just stood on the other side of the lifter. <laughs> How are we both so dumb as to think it was a backwards three? That's a three from my perspective. Greg, I'm over here. Come over here. It's a yeah. three. <laughs> it's an E. No, it's a three, stupid. <laughs> Uh, but I like how we all say backwards yeah. three, and why the lift, why we're always on this side well, of the lift. Drop because the a, side, a three would imply it's a good lift, but a backwards three, it just sounds <laughs> yeah, like a, a yeah, mistake. It's backwards. <laughs> a three, well, that's fine. Um, so, I mean, you're already getting off of your basic S curve pattern if the bar is coming around. If if you have pressure on the front of your foot too soon and you're not able to correct that, um, and of course, passing the knee is the one point where the bar has its largest advantage over you, uh, you could potentially be pulled forward and the whole trajectory, even if done well, is gonna 
be consummated in front of you so you're gonna have to have a little hop forward I will say there is a version of the s-curve that allows for a slight jump forward but it would be a consistent slight jump forward not like the weight gets heavier and then I jump forward and then when it gets heavier I jump more forward but Greg's like doing his head like he doesn't even like me saying that it I exists. just hate, I well, hate it's about, it for, oh, of course it, it exists. It's, it's like 10% of the world records when yeah. you look at those charts of with it. So it's really small. And you're probably not it. Oksana Don't, Slavenko had you're it. You're not a 10 percenter. Yeah, you're probably not. You want to be a 50 percenter if Oksana you can Oksana Slavenko had a, had a weird pull. Well, and I she was watching her lift and it was like, it's, it's she was definitely forward. unique. Yeah, she was forward, but she was teaching a lot of people that when she was here. And so, um, I mean, it did exist. And of course, I think she did have world records. I know she was a world champion. So... Yeah, good for her. Um, I, wait, I gotta I gotta tell the story because it, it cracked me up. So she did. She came to the states uh, with with her coach and and Sofinev. yeah, who who I really liked. He just seemed so angry all the time. I was like, <laughs> oh, this guy is perfect. He was so cool. He he was really nice. He and uh, he like gave me a, a team Russian shirt and I had him sign it for us and stuff. But anyway, we went out to we took them all out to dinner and. Uh, so Oksana and Vladimir were in the car with well, my wife Amy and me and we were kind of talking about lifting and Amy was like yeah 2009 or whatever I made the world team and Oksana's in the back seat she's like yeah that's the one I won just like <laughs> it was like the most normal casual thing to say like oh I made the world team yeah I won that one yeah I, I loved it it was just so <laughs> cold blooded <laughs> you're awful so anyway getting back um. to jumping forward but I bet you, I'm, I'm going to shut up now. I was going to say something about drug testing. I'm just going to leave it alone. Um, so the other thing is like once, oh, so let's say from the ground to your knee, your pressure on your foot is good and you're not getting pulled forward and you're hanging over the bar so that you're not going to pull behind the bar too early. You could still pull behind the bar too early. Like if you sh pull your shoulders back too early, that could result in the bar being forward. Uh, because when you go to extend, the bar might not actually come back and, and land over you. Um, alternately, you could jump early. You could contact early. So that would mean you got on the front of your foot before the bar got to your hip. So we could have a pressure shift issue there as well. Um, if you get all to that point and you're doing well and uh, you're at your hip, and you're balanced and if you extend up the bar should come over you you still have to additionally ensure that uh, your wrist and elbows direct the bar so that it doesn't loop out because you still have a little bit of a angle of the bar coming into the hip you want to minimize that angle the more if the bar's coming in at a high angle it's going to pop off the hip and so now you're really going to have the potential for the bar to land in front um, but let's say you do all that well but you have a, lock, a long radius ulnar length and you turn the bar at the elbow instead of pulling up with the elbow and then putting yourself under, that bar could end up in front. And then if it's heavy enough relative to you, it's going to pull you forward instead of it coming back toward you. Um, yeah, so in other words, basically at every single stage of the lift, there is a way to mistakenly yep. either propel yourself forward or get pulled forward in reaction. Um, so just a quick recap. Basically, uh, until the bar is at the hip, the, the main issue is that you need to be, um, you know, pushing with the legs, staying over the bar and maintaining a balance uh, approximately over the whole foot. And I would say maybe slightly behind midfoot in most cases, not on the heel, but slightly behind midfoot. If you're on the heel you're probably going to end up rocking forward and it's going to you're going to end up more forward than you would have been had you been balanced uh, it seems counterintuitive but it happens um hitting low is a big one too that that's a really that's good point the early jump, is yeah. right and, and people start opening up they bring the shoulders back early uh bar contacts low on the thighs and you got to understand it as as you are initiating that second pull the knees are moving forward their thighs are attached to the knees which means when the bar contacts them, it not only prevents the bar from coming all the way back into the hip, it's gonna actually be pushing the bar forward because the thighs are moving forward. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, if you weigh 100 kilos, the bar weighs 50 kilos, it's not gonna make that big of a difference. You're bigger, you have more inertia, the bar is gonna come back to you uh, because you can muscle you it, can back it back there. Yeah. If it's reversed, you know, if you're a 69 kilo lifter and you're snatching 110 kilos or 120 kilos, Every little bit of horizontal movement in that bar is going to have a huge effect on your body. It's going to pull you with it. Um, 
and then yeah the hitting hit not only hitting the hip because the bar has been too far away from you first and having it really bounce forward off you um but a pull where you're really driving your hips forward through that vertical plane uh you know from your about your ankle so if you're you know if you're i've said this a billion times i'm going to say it again if you're looking at a lifter from the side and just in a standing position you imagine a vertical line drawn through like ankle hip and shoulder basically during that pull the hips will start behind that they're going to move into that vertical line and then move up in that vertical line can you guys all see my hand gestures right yes, now? Yes, I can see Ursula that. is totally watching, so she gets it. <laughs> yeah. um, it we need like a, a little corner box with like the sign language interpreter, but it's just my hands <laughs> making these stupid gestures. Or your your wrist yeah. and elbow <laughs> doing your uh, And so the um, Oh God, if what was I saying? Shoot, oh, if, if the hips go, shoot, yeah. Shoot, if the hips, if the hips go forward, forward through, so you're, you're kind of humping the bar yeah. to a little too much, okay. um, you, you're going to be pushing the bar forward. So you've, you've got to balance that explosive hip extension. I think you're describing a catapult. A smackapult, <laughs> the banana slam. Um, well, and it's, it's just people who get overly focused on the hips. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. everything comes from the hips. The hip it's like, well, you need extension. the legs with the hips. Yeah. And then, yeah, if you get, you can have a perfect extension pretty much up to that point, but if you don't actively pull yourself under the bar with the proper upper body mechanics, then you and the bar are gonna drift apart. And again, if that bar is heavy, it's gonna wanna come out in front of you. So the actual fixes, uh, if you find- Snatch right. Sna <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go, Jonathan. Ursula really got to the bottom of that. Um, the, the, the pull from the floor, doing things like uh, segment or pause deadlifts or pulls. So, for example, you pause and hold one inch off the floor. Like the moment the plates separate, you pause. You feel that balance on the foot. You pause again at the knee. Again, you feel shoulders are either directly above the bar or very slightly in front of the bar at the knee. And you're balanced across the whole foot. Not way back on the heels, not on the balls of the feet. If your toes are clawing into the ground, you're way too far forward. Um, if And then uh, I like to pause again at mid-thigh and really make sure your shoulders are over the bar. Now they're really over the bar. Your shins are not vertical, but kind of getting close. And again, you're still balanced over the whole foot. And if you are able to do that exercise with pretty heavy weight, you know, 80 to 100% of your snatch and keep that balance, keep that posture, there's no reason you can't do it when you snatch. You just have to be focused on it. Um, what, what else do you like for that initial part, just practicing that balance and strength? Well, I mean, I do the halting work too, snatches with pauses. Um, I actually have a method of... of initially teaching where we try to uh emphasize all of that the, the little pause method yep. of teaching that i use bottom I up it too. yeah just you know having them pause it below the knee or somewhere off the floor above the knee uh in the hip having them catch it in a power snatch to make sure they meet the bar and and that they actually extend to meet the bar um and then having them sit in the hole and pause there and i mean i think that gets all of your positions um, if you if you can do that, um, and, and then you can hold and, and recreate that foot pressure as the weight gets heavier, then you, you shouldn't run into these problems um, down the road. But, you know, coaching and, and learning the lifts is a lot about trying to, as the lifter, like first you're teaching them the pull mechanics, like what we just described, but then you are trying to make sure that that is duplicated and you're reinforcing and you're reassessing and you're inserting the exercises that help that athlete. So if I'm having a lot of problems when I pass my knee getting pull pulled forward, then I might want to do some pausing work through there to ensure um, that that doesn't happen when the weights get heavy and something like a pull to above the knee plus a snatch might be helpful. Yeah. If it's If they're jumping early, you might want to either put them on a platform to make sure they stand all the way to the hip, like an elevated platform, uh, to to make sure they're still doing that. If they have, if they actually do cut the extension, because that's a possibility as well, um, that's kind of down the road. But you have to look for the root cause. If that, if they do that, maybe some hip muscle squat snatches, you know, with a little bit more weight, or hip snatches or hang snatches to make sure snatch high pulls to a stick to make sure they're that's not happening 
during that portion. So you have to identify where in the lift they're getting off and then address exactly that yeah, uh, the, problem. The other one that I, I like more and more the longer I do this for this. You're going to say muscle squat snatch? No. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sure yesterday. not. Um, I was doing those because I have a bad habit of not finishing my pull with heavy snatches. <laughs> yeah, so that's good for extension. But um, is a, it's like slow pull snatches. So basically mm -hmm. like a three count to, you know, above the knee or mid thigh and then normal tempo the rest mm -hmm. of the way. And that just for, not only gets a lifter really strong in that yeah. correct posture, but it gives you that extra time to feel the balance and make those adjustments and you just practice the movement correctly over and over. And I, the point I love to emphasize with people, because it, it's so simple, but it's so important is that your body is always going to revert to where it is strongest and to what it's most accustomed to. So if you're always pulling too far over the bar or you're getting too far behind the bar early, as the weight gets heavier, you're going to be more and more apt to go back mm -hmm. to those positions. Mm -hmm. So if you don't put the time in and strengthen those things, it's unreasonable to expect yourself to execute the lift properly at maximal weights. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, Bad habits always tend to show back up when the weight yeah. gets heavy. So that's pull from the floor to about the hip or so kind of covered. So what about that that final extension and kind of guiding the bar what do you like doing oh, i just said hip muscle squat okay snatch, muscle squat muscle snatch, squat snatch or snatch. or snatch with no jump no contact i like the no contact one for getting leg drive in there mm -hmm. um but i like a snatch high pull mm -hmm. plus a snatch or a hang snatch i really like because you have to you have to really focus on not only the balance in the pole because you're going to be up on your toes in that high pole the bar finalizes that elevation um but you have to practice the transition between legs and hips and arms and you have to extend and, up right, right. you, you have really have to extend up extension. you can't just lean backward or, yeah, or hit the bar forward hit a stick. and then you have to practice the mechanics of the arms that initial guiding of the bar and the body right next to each other you can't do a high pull with the bar 18 inches in front of you mm -hmm. you can try but it won't work um and then i still like like snatch from power position or or mm -hmm. dip snatch or hip snatch to work on that um, kind of the, the hip and, and bar interaction and the mechanics of keeping it close on the way under. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it really depends on, on the way under. Right, actually yeah. pulling yourself under instead of expecting a miracle. Um, somehow the, the rules of physics won't apply momentarily and uh, something will intervene divinely. Um, so yeah. Jonathan, it could be a matter of patience and timing as if, as in you're jumping too early and so your knees are coming forward, the bar's getting in front of you or, or whatever the case is, but it could be a lot of things. Yeah. And so what, what I would do is get some video of yourself and kind of, I would, you know, watch your feet and see if you notice in the pole rocking towards your toes or Work rocking towards your, your heels and then rocking again, kind of see if you can find out where it's coming from and then basically address it with exercises uh, like and, and queuing accordingly. Yeah. All right. We're we gonna go to Brian, or we're we gonna do Norma Jean. What do you want to do? I think we we, we do Brian. Let's let's Brian. let's knock Brian out here. Um, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> Brian says I recently moved and had to store all my weightlifting gear in a storage container, and I'm staying in a long-term stay hotel with minimal exercise facility. Just curious what weightlifting programming I can accomplish with mediocre training facilities slash equipment. Basically what a bare bones training session could be when I find myself without a platform, bumpers, and a bearing bar. Thank you for the advice. Now that I read this for the second time, I wonder, I mean, he must have access to a bar and weights, right? right? He says a bearing bar. Right. Yeah, this seems like he's probably got metal plates, a bar that doesn't spin. Okay, so let's let's picture like my garage gym from sixth grade. So it's been <laughs> or my backyard. Right. Was in sixth grade. A rusty ass bar and you know, half half the plates are iron, the other half are those old like sand filled ones. Yeah, we had those. Shit. Yeah. We had those. <laughs> Looks like you basically like uh bought your weight set at a prison garage sale. Um you, you know, you're doing your Or your, from Ursula's backyard. <laughs> your lat your lat raises with bags of water. Um <laughs> gotta get creative in there, guys. Uh so yeah, we kind of talked about this for a, for a moment before we started recording, but there are so many things you can do 
other than snatch clean jerk um you do have to be creative it's not going to be as exciting if you really like snatching and cleaning and jerking but the, the number one most obvious thing is literally every single squat variation you can yeah. think of and, and i can think like of about a hundred of them one like it variations right. like front rack lunges and step ups possibly if you have something to step up if you have even just like, like stairs a, a you can bench. do it yeah, yeah quiet my dog's over here getting pissed off we're doing a, a podcast well, i won't throw the ball again he I wants just attention yeah he doesn't he doesn't care about brian's problem here <laughs> um so okay. all the squatting variations you can do pretty much any kind of deadlift or pull variation too um especially if you're using straps even if you don't have straps if you're good at holding onto a bar which is a pretty key ability in weightlifting um, you don't have to slam the bar back down on the ground. So you don't need a platform. You don't need bumper plates. Um, you just have to have some semblance of control as you're lowering the bar. So you've got you know, your, your basic snatch and clean deadlifts. You've got halting deadlifts. You've got segment deadlifts. You've got segment pulls. You can stand on plates and do you know, pulls from a deficit. You've got RDLs uh, with all of that. Yeah, RDLs, stiff-legged deadlifts, straight-legged deadlifts, single-leg RDLs, single-leg <laughs> stiff-legged deadlift. <laughs> I mean, like, you can go on and on and on. Bubba Gump? Um, yeah. <laughs> Boiled deadlifts, fried deadlifts. Uh, so, you know, basically imagine any any lift that doesn't require you dropping a bar or spinning a bar. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can't, like, turn over a clean with a bar that doesn't spin. You're going to hurt your wrist. But you, you might be able to do something like a muscle clean. Right, like exactly. more deliberate. Definitely muscle snatches with relatively lightweight muscle cleans. Uh, potentially Um, you know you can do all kinds of hang pole variations things like that and then you can do all kinds of pressing variations too you can do straight presses you can do press and split you can do uh, you know jerk and split jerk and split behind the neck you can do jerk balances you can do power jerks like again literally anything that doesn't have to be dropped and is within your ability so you're confident you're not going to miss it and like throw it through a, a second floor uh, uh, floor, uh, second floor floor. That sounds so dumb. I'm embarrassed. You know what I mean? Like if you're sitting in an upstairs hotel floor. room and you're dropping iron, you know, 225 and iron plates, someone's going to get pissed off. Um, so, I mean, you can go on our and website. And all your push pressing stuff behind the neck and front. Right. Of the There's a million. I mean, and then you have you all. You can do overhead squats. You can do overhead you squats. Do, snatch push press. Snatch balance. You can do snatch balance. Yeah. You can basically do anything you're confident you don't need to drop. Uh, so you can go on our website. There's an exercise library with videos and all these things. You could probably find 300 exercises on there that you could do. Um, and, and so you can get a lot if, of variety. he's got dumbbells. Oh, and geez. Can, yeah, now you've got opened it all up again. There's a whole nother rabbit hole. <laughs> I mean, but you could do dumbbell snatch and dumbbell clean and jerks. Dumbbell curls, supinating curls, Zotman curls, <laughs> alternating curls, curl and press, also known as the roadhouse complex for that long lean look. Uh, yeah, you can just Arnold go press. on and on. Arnold presses, yep. Uh, it's so cool to get things named after you that you didn't invent. That's just when you know you're quite the quite the big big name um weeder principle 465 another one that i didn't create <laughs> uh so pr- programming i think becomes more of the question is when you're you're limited to more strength type exercises yeah. and accessory type exercise well how do you put that together and that is a great question for ursula <laughs> oh I'm, ta- I'm like over here talking to the dog um what was the question you just, just made it up. It's not even in no, here. No, just, just, well, because what would bare I put bones together? training session is what like, would how, I put how together? do you put programming together? Well, I mean, I would put some pressing, some pulling, and some squats. Holy shit. <laughs> I, I mean, revolutionary. Genius. You should write a book. Probably some one-legged work um, every other day or so to okay. try to maintain bilateral symmetry if you're squatting a lot and to alleviate uh, have you know the knees blowing out I mean you're gonna the problem is the potential to run into some overuse injuries when you're doing all of the same movements so you might want to do a, a squat a pull some you know variety grip pressing one day some dumbbell snatching the next day you can do dumbbell clean and jerk um, another very maybe a push press instead of strict pressing if you did the pressing the day before maybe we're gonna switch out for an RDL and, a, and some le- one-legged work instead of a squat and a pull so, I mean, really, you're just trying to avoid 
stressing the same joints in the same way on yeah. a repetitive basis and doing some dynamic work mixed in so that you get so some we didn't mention sessions. jumping there's a million yeah, jump variations jumps, bilateral unilateral um skipping bounding like i mean oh, i was thinking with the barbell uh, you can well, do that too. the barbell yeah, yeah. Um, we feel the, like if you're not working out, Brian, you just don't want to. Yeah, you just you're just <laughs> course, looking for. I don't want to, to, as we saw today <laughs> yeah. when I was in a gym that had virtually fucking everything you could think of. It's basically the greatest gym on earth. It's um, pretty fucking awesome. It's it's, it's the greatest. Much. It's certainly the greatest weightlifting gym in Terrebonne, Oregon, hands down. <laughs> In this region, in the, yeah, yeah. yeah, probably Oregon. Um, we could expand it. No, you, I mean you've you, got every fucking thing imaginable. Yeah, basically, Brian, we're in the exact opposite situation as you. Yeah, um, and I still did nothing, you, Brian. So don't feel bad if. Yeah, I, you can. You basically, all she did was test out our basement bed, um, uh, make sure it still worked. Yeah, I could make sure it, you could sleep in it for fifteen hours. So a, a, <laughs> a simple way to look at the programming thing too is like kind of a Kyle Pierce sort of template where you're basically alternating push and pull days. So, you know, your Monday, Wednesday would be squatting stuff and pressing stuff. Your Tuesday, Thursday would be pulling thing, you know, deadlift and pull variations, rowing, uh, things like that. And then, you know, you can have a fifth day. It's more like a, a bodybuilding breakdown. Yeah. yeah. Um, a fifth day you can try to do you know some more dynamic stuff some snatch and clean and jerk muscle snatches muscle cleans dumbbell snatches one arm dumbbell snatches power snatches you know overhead squats that sort of thing um and then some squats and whatever accessory work so you you can keep you can make it as simple or as complex as possible and then really just go by feel on that stuff i mean you don't have to try to figure out percentages for all these weird variations just say, okay, well, you know, for this first two to three weeks, I'm going to work at this rep range on these exercises and I'm going to try to build up and basically go as heavy as I can by that second or third week and then back off a little bit, maybe change up the exercises for another, you know, three to four week block and do the same thing. So you can, you can make it very simple. It can be very effective and, uh, you know, take, take advantage of, of, I guess you could call this an opportunity if you were a super optimistic person, um, and build some strength and work on things that you don't normally work on. Yeah. Be a better work person for it. You could do some push press plus overhead squat with an arrow grip. Yeah. You could get super supple, <laughs> super rami. <laughs> All right. Well, Norma Jean, I'm sorry to say it. You're just going to have to wait till next time, which could be uh, two to eight weeks. <laughs> we don't know. I'm Ursula Ursula has bad. to go to Mars or something yeah. next week. I don't even I go know. go to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. So I, we can figure out the weight classes. So by the next podcast, we can actually discuss the new weight classes. Oh, I know you can't wait. Gracious. You can't wait. What is there to discuss, really? Here this are the new weight, weight classes. classes. Get into one of them, <laughs> and that's it. End of discussion. <laughs> oh, you don't like them? No one cares <laughs> because nothing's going to happen. Um, if you guys have a spare moment in your lives, I know you're all very busy. But oh, I have something to say. Oh, oh do I it. have a course. I know it's on my phone. It's in August, I think, 23, 24. You think? Yeah. Okay, Ursula thinks she has a course in No, August. I know I have a course, <laughs> and I know it's in San Diego, Ooh. and I know it's at Validus. But that's all I, I mean, I think it's the August, August 23rd. Okay, well, where I'll can someone it. find this On my weightliftingwise.com website, I have, which is the most basic looking website. It looks like a four-year-old did it. That was me. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> but I have a, a link to register. Okay, so, go, so go, yeah. go check that out. And if you have a spare moment, go on iTunes or whatever you listen to this on. Please leave us a review. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your enemies, tell strangers you meet on the street. Everybody needs to hear this podcast. It's very important for the future of our world. Uh, or just to keep us Saving motivated. The world to one do, do, it, do it do it selfishly because the more people listen to it, the more we're gonna be the more inclined compelled are, to yeah. do it and then you'll get to hear it more. So it can be do totally it for yourself. selfish. Yeah. yeah. All right guys, thank you again for listening. We'll talk to you next time at some unspecified point in the near future. See ya.